good morning. Welcome, welcome. It's a good morning, I think. It wasn't good when I woke up and realized it was an hour later than I felt like it should have been. Uh, but we've, we've progressed. Good morning to you walk, watching online. Uh, you know what happened. You didn't intend to watch online today. You meant to be here, uh, but you woke up late. It's okay. I am fully in support that I think Spring Forward Day, henceforth and forevermore, should just be online church day. And we just close it down. We all watch it in our pajamas. Jeff's not even here today. He wouldn't even know. We could get away with it, y'all. We just thought a little bit ahead. So we're, we're going through this series on bless. Uh, blessing one another, how to live a life of blessing. It's not just blessing once or twice. It's living an entire lifestyle of blessing. And so uh, the first week, we kind of did an overview. The second week, we talked about praying before anything else. And make that a pattern of your life, a life devoted to prayer before you undertake any endeavor. Uh, the second word, uh, letter was L, uh, was listen, right? So listening is key. If you want to change your relationships with other people and improve your relationships, listening is so key. Uh, last week was, I think, my favorite week of all time ever, uh, was eating. And I'm convinced. We just need to do a whole series on eating. I think it was fun. I could, I could do that, and we could do different. We've done kind of fruits. That was fun. Maybe we could do desserts or something. I don't know. Uh, this week, we're talking about service. And then the next two weeks, we're going to be spending two weeks on uh, sharing our story and sharing the story of what Christ has done. And so this week, as I was thinking about service, I was, uh, I was on my way into work, and I got behind a guy uh, or gal, I'm not sure, of the gender, uh, who had, uh, was, he was going very slow, she was going very slow, and uh, they had a bunch of stickers on their, the back of their car. And one of them was 26.2, and then the next one was 13.6, and they continued to rub it into my face. <laughs> they were way more athletic than I am, all the way down to like a 5K, and I was like, I feel like if you've run the 26.2, you don't really need the 5K sticker. Like, that's like the participation pro- trophy for me. You know, and so I got to thinking, I was like, man, I should run a marathon. I could do that, right? I could run a marathon. Thinking also that the first person to ever run a marathon died afterwards, like his heart exploded. It was, so I'm like, let's be careful. But I could run a marathon. I've run a quarter of a marathon before. I've done that. It can't be that hard to just repeat that three times, right? I'm getting confused about what a marathon is and what a quarter of a marathon is. I was confused about what it is and what it isn't. And then I thought, oh, I could do it. It wouldn't be that bad. But it's hard. It's hard to run a marathon. And then I got to think about all the time you have to spend training. I don't have time for that. It costs me too much time. I got no time. I just get out there and walk, right? Same thing. And then I realized, like, that is the difference between serving once and living a life of service. We get confused on what those two things are. We think serving once is living a life of service as opposed to being fully devoted to service. Just like running a little bit is, is the same as running a marathon. I can run. Sure you can. It's hard. Living a life of service, regular service, devoted day in and day out is difficult. It's why we talk about people like Mother Teresa, and we don't talk about me. Service is hard, and it also costs us a whole lot. If you're going to live a life of service, it's going to cost you something. So uh, today as we talk about, uh, I want to be a, I want to live a life of service. And I think if you're a follower of Jesus, you actually want to be a servant. You don't want to just serve once. You want to follow in Christ's footsteps. And I know it's difficult. So I want us to unearth some of those things uh, that stand in our way of doing that. And so that we can live a life of blessing and a life of service. We're in Luke chapter 10. I'm sorry, Mark chapter 10. Sorry, I love Luke. Mark chapter 10, uh, verse 35 to 45 talking about James and John. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. What makes this scene so incredible is what happened before it. Jesus just told the disciples as they're on their way to Jerusalem, Hey, heads up, Uh, we're going to go to Jerusalem. I am going to be betrayed by one of you. Uh, then you're going to hand me over to the religious leaders, they're going to hand me over to the Romans, and they're going to crucify me, kill me, but I'm going to raise on the third day. And so James and John hear that, and they're like, oh, this is a great opportunity to ask for whatever we want. Totally makes logical sense. I mean, how, how tone deaf could you be? James and John are like, this is our opportunity. This is our chance to get whatever we want from Jesus. And this is the third prediction of Jesus' death. It's not like this is the first time he said it. And the first time he did it, Peter came back and was like, no, 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 you're not going to die. You're okay. And Jesus is like, nah, that's not how this works. You don't tell me. 
The second time he makes the prediction, the disciples all get together and start arguing. Who do you think is the most important? Which I can only imagine is after Jesus is gone, who's going to take his place? Like, who's going to be in charge? And then this time, James and John are like, well, I guess we better put our name in the hat. And this tells us how we get service confused. It tells us what service is not, what service isn't. It's not self-focused. Look again at verse 35. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. James and John are a part of Jesus' inner circle. They're part of his close friend group, and uh, even more so than the disciples. Now, in the Matthew telling of this story, they get their mom to go and ask. So James and John are brothers, and they go get their mom to ask Jesus for an important spot in the kingdom. I mean, imagine, Mom... Mom, can you ask Jesus if we can be really important, please? And back in those days, day and age, and, and somewhat in our day and age, uh, older women could get away with saying things that the rest of us cannot. And if you've ever been to Thanksgiving dinner, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> They're doing the same thing here. And what you notice is it's James and John and their mom asking this question. You know what that tells us? They're looking out for the family. They're looking out for the family. The family, uh, Zebedee's family, is going to be in charge. Zebedee's family is going to be in control. And this flies right in the face of what Jesus taught in Mark chapter 3. In Mark chapter 3, Jesus says, you know who your family is? You know who's the most important people in your life? The people that do the will of God. Those are the people that are supposed to be close to you. Not your business connections, not your, not your relationships, not your friends, not your family. The people that are most important to you are the people who love me and serve me. And James and John are sitting here being like, nope, we're going to watch out for us. We're going to watch out for our family. If we're going to live lives of service, we have to stop thinking about our group. We have to start thinking, stop thinking about our tribe and think about what do other people need? What, how can I advocate for other people, even to my own disadvantage? How can I stand up for people that need help? We've got to get our eyes off of ourselves and off of our group. So it's not self-focused. It's also not self-care. Look at verse 36. And he said to them, what do you want me to do for you? Now, how many of us have kids, uh, have kids that have asked this question? Not, what do you want me to do for you? Because that would be awesome. If you have kids that come up to you and like, Mom, Dad, what can I do for you? Tell me, secrets, please. What have you given them? No, we ask questions all the time uh, when we were kids. Do you remember going to your mom and dad and be like, Mom, I'm going to ask you something, and I need you to just say yes. <laughs> just say yes. Just promise me you'll say yes. And Jesus is like, all right, guys, what do you want me to do for you? Here are two grown men being like, Jesus... Please, I want you to do something for us. He's like, what do you want? Let me ask you this. If Jesus were to ask you, what do you want me to do for you, what would you say? What do you want me to do for you? I'll tell you what I would say. It would be some kind of self-care. Make me healthier. Make me able to run a marathon without, like, busting a gut. That'd be great. Help me be a better father, better, better husband, better pastor, right? Help me be better. It would be self-care. Do you know the self-care industry in the United States is an $11 billion industry? And it's growing. We love self-care. Because what we've done is we've traded the gospel and we've traded uh, the person and power of Jesus Christ for an Instagram influencer who tells us everything we want to know and feel that's good about ourselves. It's okay to not be okay. It's fine. You can be vulnerable. Be authentic. It's good. Now, there's some truth there. It is okay to not be okay. That's part of being a Christian too, right? Like going to the cross and being like, I'm not okay. And she's being like, I know, I got it. But the problem is we stop there. And, the, and the, the, the influencer lets us stop there as well. They don't challenge us to move beyond it. They don't challenge us to move beyond it. Uh, Lee Stein, in an article that was sent to me by Blair Thomas, who's one of our uh, volunteers here, he works here uh, behind the scenes, running all the cameras and stuff like that. Blair's awesome, great guy. And uh, he paid me to say that. <laughs> and in a scarily on point article that he sent me, Uh, in the New York Times by Lee Stein, who's not a follower of Christ, by the way. She says that uh, we're finding our hope on a screen filled with influencers. And she says this, our new belief system is a blend of left-wing political orthodoxy, intersectional feminism, therapy, wellness, astrology, and Dolly Parton. And she's not wrong. She goes on to compare Instagram influencers and other influencers on social media to televangelists. She calls them instavangelists. She's not wrong. We like people for telling us we're okay. We want people to tell us what we want to hear. They say these these influencers say, "What do you want us to do for you?" And then we 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 like we want you to tell us that, like it's okay. 
And that's not wrong. But what are we looking for? Who are we looking for to tell us it's okay? Because the message of the gospel comes in behind it and says, it's not okay. Or it is, you're okay. You're fine. But you can't stay there. You got to move forward. That's the difference between Jesus and other people. He's not going to leave you there. He wants you and he loves you so much that he wants to rescue you and redeem you so that he can make you into what you were created to be so that you can bring God glory and so that you can build the kingdom of God. And again, I know that, that part of it is a pushback against like Protestant uh, theology of, of work harder, get better, uh, the Protestant work ethic. I know we're, we're pushing against that and that's great. But we've torn down one idol for a lifestyle of self-care and self-focus. We need to listen to the words of Jesus because he's going to affirm us, but he's also going to challenge us. He's going to convict us of where we need to let go of our selfishness. So when somebody asks you, when the king of kings asks you, what do you want me to do for you? The first thought coming to our mind should be, how can I serve the kingdom? How can I serve in the kingdom? So it's not self-focused. It's also not self Serving. Verse 37. And they said to him, Grant us to sit one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory. Now, James and John probably think that they're doing like a really nice, uh, a really smart thing here. Because in that culture, the person in the middle was the most important. And then the person on the right, so it'd be over here for y'all, person on the right, second most important. And the person on the left was the third most important. So they're saying, Jesus, dude, you're the best. You're the boss, man. You're in charge. But we want to be like next to you, we want to be second boss. We want middle management. They want to be important. And they probably think that like they're honoring God in this way. They're honoring Jesus in that way. And we do this a lot too. We, we, we worship Jesus in order to get something out of it. We, we serve in order to get something. We, we, we have this expression that we use a lot, and I think it's appropriate. I'm blessed to be a blessing. But I think many of us actually in our hearts say that I'm, I bless so that I'll get a blessing. I do something so that I'll get something out of Jesus. Now, there's a part of service. There's a part of helping others that is also helping ourselves. And we can't get away that, from that. We're interconnected human beings. When you suffer, I suffer. When you're wounded, I'm wounded. And it's not just because we're a part of the church. That's a part of how humanity works. When you do well, I do well. So we're never going to get away from total self-focus. But there is an element of serving other people where we think to ourselves, man, how am I going to get something out of this? And the way this looks is you might choose the most convenient act of service over what's the most important, the closest over what's the most urgent, what's the most visible as opposed to the more important thing that's behind the scenes. And what happens is we even use this in our relationship with God. Now, we're much more sophisticated than to just walk up to Jesus in our prayers and be like, okay, God, I helped out some poor little children. You owe me something. We're more sophisticated than that. How many of us have approached the throne of God in prayer and have felt just a little bit more worthy to be there because we did something good. We did something nice. Y'all, that's not the gospel. The only right we have to be before the Father is because of what Jesus Christ did for us, his service, his sacrifice. Anything else is gospel plus, and it doesn't work. It doesn't mean you're not a Christian. It means that you have something uh, broken, in the way that you're approaching God. And Jesus wants to fix that. He wants to challenge you to fix that. When we serve people, it can't be about us. And Travis, you're making service really complicated here, I feel like. Not helping me. Service is hard. Let's talk about why it's hard. Because I think when you see why it's hard, you'll see what service actually is. Go back to verse 38. Jesus said to them, you do not know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? And they said to him, we're able. And Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand and to sit at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. James and John are so ambitious. If you ever get worried that Jesus is tired of your prayers, you think, you think you're annoying to him, go back and read this passage. Look how gracious he is with two guys that have no idea what's going on in his life and are completely tone deaf about it. He's so gracious to them. He's like, guys, you don't know what you're asking. Jesus is about to go to Jerusalem. He's about to die. He's about to suffer on a cross. And that's his next glory, okay? Yes, he's glorified after the resurrection, but sometimes the glory he talks about is the glory of the crucifixion. 
And so when he comes into his glory there, the places prepared for him to his right and to his left are two thieves that are being crucified alongside him. And I guarantee you, James and John want none of that. But Jesus says this, you're going to suffer. You, you're not going to suffer here, but you're going to suffer later. And we know this to be true. James is the first apostle killed for his faith. He's talked about Max. John, we know, according to church history, uh, lives longer than any of them. Imagine that, the brothers of Zeb- the brothers Zebedee bookending the deaths of the apostles, the first one and the last one. You're going to suffer. This tells us why service is hard. One, it tells us service is hard because it's joining in and suffering. Look at verse 38. Jesus said to them, you don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? In the Old Testament, to drink the cup meant to to take whatever God gives you in your life. So sometimes the cup was really good. Your cup runneth over, cup of blessing, right? But sometimes the cup wasn't good. Sometimes it was wrath, judgment, misfortune. We would say it like this, uh, playing out the hand that life dealt you. It's the more atheistic way, I guess, to go about doing it. And so what Jesus is saying is, I've been given a cup, and you can't drink this cup. Because the cup that Jesus is going to drink is the cup that's been assigned to all of us. Because of our sin, because of our brokenness, because of the wickedness of humanity, each single one of us have been given a cup to drink. And it's a cup of wrath and judgment. I know, scary. Because God's justice demands that evil be punished, and we are all there. But Jesus Christ on the cross comes to you and he comes to me and he says, look, I'll take your cup for you and I'll drink it down to the dregs and you won't have to take a sip of it. And all you have to do is put your faith in me that it counts. Put your faith in the cross that I've got it covered. And people, you can do that today. You don't have to wait. Why are you holding on to this cup? This cup of brokenness, this cup of sadness, this cup of rejection, this cup of loneliness that's a product of of evil in our life, side effects of wickedness in our life. And I don't mean like you've done something wrong and so now you're lonely. I don't mean that. I mean we live in a sinful world. And part of living in a sinful world is this alienation we have from each other and alienation from God. And you can exchange that cup today for a cup of blessing and love and comfort from God. But I'm going to warn you, when you do that, Jesus then calls us to get our head up, look around, and say, all right, I can't drink down everybody else's cup but I can drink a little bit. And so I look at everybody else. They're lonely. I'm going to take a sip of that. They're suffering. I'm going to take a sip of that. I'm going to do my best to alleviate the pain and suffering, which means you have to enter into pain and suffering with other people. We can't just hold people at an arm's length. When my daughter was littler than she already is, Hattie, uh, she, uh, we, we made her eat carrots. Uh, we still make her eat carrots. What am I talking about? We still do vegetables because we're good parents. We're not crazy. Um, but, but we were like, hey, you've got to finish your vegetables before you can have a treat. And, and I don't know, if, if those of you that have kids, did you ever go through this phase where like your kids would eat something they didn't like, but it would just stay in their mouth, like in perpetuity? Like I'm confident she still has carrot in her mouth from that evening, just persistent. And it was taking forever. And I realized this was an opportunity. I don't do this often, so don't hear me and be like, wow, Travis, super holy dad. This was just a moment of like the Holy Spirit leading. Like I can teach her about the cross right here. And I came over to her plate and I ate the carrots, ate them all, and I said, Hattie, your carrots are gone. You can have a treat now. That is what it means. That's what Christ has done for us. He's taken the evil on our, on our behalf. And now we get to go to other people and say, hey, I'm going to try and take some of your suffering. I'm going to try to alleviate some of that. That's what service is. And that's why it's hard, because we don't want to suffer. I got enough pain in my life. I don't want to take yours on. But that is exactly what Christ calls us to do. And he does it by doing it first. But it's also trusting God for results. Look at verse 39. And they said to him, we're able. And Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand and to sit at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. Jesus tells James and John, you're going to suffer. You're going to hurt. You're going to be rejected. And you're not going to know what you get out of it. And man, oh man, do we not like to know what we're going to get out of something. Like, you won't even commit to, like, go hang out with somebody until you're like, well, what am I going to get out of this? Is there dinner involved? Can I eat? Now we're back on last week. I, if somebody told me that there would be zero health, health benefits for me exercising, I'd quit. I'd quit yesterday. I don't even care. I'd go get me, like, a pack of ho-hos and just go to town. Good stuff. We love to know what we're going to get out of something, and the reason why is because it gives us control. 
because it's control. We like to have control. We like to know what results are. And this influences every single part of our life. It's there and you don't even realize it. And so when we serve, when we try to live a life of service, we go to a place and, and their ways are not like ours. And we come in and we tell them how they think we should do, they should do it. And because they're humble, they're like, okay, that's not really going to work. But because you are, you know, some Westerner or whatever that's coming to our world, sure, we'll listen to you. Fine. And then, it, then something happens. We start judging results, right? And we're like, number of schools built, number of baptisms, number of people saved, number of puppies rescued. And we're like, well, this isn't working. This didn't work. Let's go somewhere else. And we're like, and we just bounce from service project to service project because we don't feel like we're making a difference because we're results oriented. And there's a par- place for being a good steward. Yes. But why don't we trust God with the results of our service? Why don't we trust him to make a difference? In the kingdom of God, it doesn't matter as much what you accomplish. It's how you go about accomplishing it. God cares much more that you be a person of humility and love and affection and faith than if you do a whole bunch of great things for him. It matters about the heart. Jesus even says, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world but loses his soul? Serving is hard, because we often don't trust God to grow the seeds that we plant. Let me ask you this. How does that make us any different than any other group of people out there? How does that make us different than any business or philanthropic organization? If we're not going to have the faith to trust God with the results of what we do. So I encourage you, live a life of service, even if it seems like it doesn't get results. Because that's how you show you're being faithful. Again, remember, Jesus died, and every single one of his followers thought, well, that's it. It's done. It's over. They didn't see how their service mattered. And then three days later, guess what happened? We had Easter. We had the first one. So Travis, you've confused me thoroughly, and you've told me this is going to be really hard, but you've still got a little bit, so let's finish this off. What's this going to cost me? What's this going to cost me? Well, let's see what we got. Let's see what we got. What's it going to cost? Verse 41, and when the ten heard it, they began to be indignant at James and John. And Jesus called them to him and said, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. Whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must also be your slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. This moment is so critical that Jesus like stops everything. How many of you are on like a vacation one time as a kid and you just started fighting with your brother and sister and your dad like went the car over and like pulled over and be like, all right, everybody listen up. Jesus is not doing that here. He is stopping the car, but this is a teachable moment. Jesus is not mad. I don't read anywhere in here that he's angry, but Jesus is like, hey, this is a good opportunity for us to talk about how our kingdom, how my kingdom is different than the world. And Jesus does this all the time where he inverts the kingdom, right? He says, turn the other cheek. He says, love your enemies. He says, if you want to live, you need to die. If you want to wield power, you need to lay it down. Jesus is telling them, this is what it costs to be a servant in the kingdom. You've got to lay down your life. And this is what Jesus does. Jesus says, I didn't come to be served. I came to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many, i.e., this is the paradigm for everybody else that's going to follow me. Jesus wants to give you a life of wholeness. He wants to give you a life of blessing. He wants to give you hope and encouragement and love. He wants to help you. He wants to make you into everything that he has created you to be, 110%. But I'm not going to do a bait and switch here. And this is where a lot of people leave you. When you are called and you put your faith in Christ, this thing starts to happen in you. The Holy Spirit starts to work in your life and you begin to change. Because following Jesus isn't just about following in his footsteps. It's becoming more like him. And if we're going to be more like Jesus, we have to recognize that it's going to cost us something. Not because uh, it's going to earn us anything, any relationship with him. That's not it but because we become fundamentally changed to be more like Christ as we grow. So what's it going to cost? Well, it's going to cost our priorities. Look again at verse 41. And when the 10 heard it, they began to be indignant at James and John. You know why I think they're mad? They're mad because they wish they had come up with the plan to ask Jesus for the second and third spots. They're not like, God, James, John, John, you guys are so insensitive. He just said he's going to die. That's not why they're mad. I think that our priorities tend to be climbing the ladder, being good at what we do, 
being happy. I watched a, a video, a compilation video. Uh, maybe you've seen them. I think it's maybe it's Glamour magazine that does them. Um, I'm not a big reader of Glamour magazine personally, but this was a YouTube video that I found. Uh, and they interviewed people from ages 5 to 75, and they would ask them one question. And it was, of course, precious, but then it, it, it got really moving. Um, they asked them, what's your goal in life? And every single one of them, every single one, said something like, be happy, win an Oscar, be famous. Some of the people that were like in their 60s and 70s were still like, I want to I win an Oscar. I want to be famous. I'm like, late bloomer, okay. <laughs> but not one of them said, I want to sacrifice for other people. I think the closest they got was like somebody said they wanted to leave a legacy for their children. Our priorities are taking care of ourselves so often. If we think something is important, we will pursue it. And usually that is taking care of my group, taking care of my people. And we get competitive when that's threatened, right? Look, laying down your life isn't just giving from what you already have. Hear this. It's not just giving from what you already have. It's also giving from the opportunities you have to gain more. Do you see that? There's this Old Testament teaching where Jesus, uh, sorry, I guess it is Jesus, but where, where God kind of gave a law and said, look, uh, when you harvest a field, if you drop anything while you're gathering things up, just let it lay there. Because the poor are going to come from behind you and they're going to gather that stuff up so we can take care of them. We're not going to exhaust every single opportunity we have to become even richer than we already are. A life of service means rejecting some of the opportunities we have. Just because we can have it doesn't mean we have a right to it. So what's a priority? It's going to also cost us our prestige. Look again at verse 42. And Jesus called them to him and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them, but it shall not be among you. Whoever would be great among you must also be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. You know what the difference is between a servant and a slave? A servant gets to go home. A servant has an identity. A servant might actually own property. It's the job. A slave, that's his life. A slave is constantly forced to think about others before themselves. Always. The most other-focused person in history is a slave. Because they have to be. And they're also marked by things, right? You could look at a slave in the days of slavery and know that that person was a slave. Whether it was based on skin color, uh, whether it was based on, on uh, tattoos or markings, whether it was chains, whether it was their clothing. We like our markers of prestige in our world. And sometimes they're big things, like we like big cars or big clothes or big, big houses. And that's how we tell people our station in life. Others of us are much more subtle. We dress down, but we got the cool shoes with the red bottoms on them. So when we cross our legs, people know what your station in life is. Or you dress like a hobo, but you've got every single technical advancement in history so that people know where you're at. When Jesus dies and he's resurrected, he tells Thomas, and we're going to talk about this on Easter, he tells Thomas to put his hands, his fingers in the holes in his hands and in his feet, which means that Jesus carries the scars of his body into eternity with him. Those don't heal up. You know why? They're markers of prestige. They're markers of his service. What markers of prestige do we carry with us in the kingdom? I'll tell you what some of them might be. There might be red and baggy eyes where you stayed up late with a friend crying on the phone because of the heartbreak in their life. There might be your hair graying a little bit early because you're working so hard to serve other people. It might be a, a host of text messages you get late at night because you're known as the one friend that people can text and call in the middle of the night and you'll answer. It might be crow's feet and laughing lines on your face because you rejoiced with those who rejoiced and you wept with those who wept. Those are markers of prestige. And I don't know that you'll lose them in the kingdom, and I don't think you'll want to. If we're going to follow Jesus, if we're going to live life to service, it's going to cost us our prestige, but we're going to gain a different kind of prestige in return. It's also going to cost us our power. Verse 45, for even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. We all want power. We all want control. I can just keep talking, and y'all will have to stay here. It's the law. so powerful. Power. Man, we all want it. We all want to be in control. Jesus, I think we would all agree, if you're here in a church, you would agree that Jesus is either the most powerful human being to ever live or is up there in power. 
I think he would have a thing to say or two about power, right? He, he should know how to use power. And the most powerful thing that ever happened was the God-man, the Son of God, laying aside his power and suffering and dying on a cross. And that changed everything for human history. The most powerful thing that ever happened was somebody laying down their power. And we think, not that doesn't work again. That's like a one-time event. It is. But it, it establishes a principle that if we're going to have power, if we're going to have impact, if we're going to, going to change the world, which is such a popular thing to say now, how about this? If you're going to change your world, the people around you, lay down your power. Lay down your authority. One of the worst things that ever happened to come from the church being in control of culture for so long in our country was that we got addicted to power. And when we've lost it, we get kind of scary when we're just grabbing it back. Jesus doesn't want us to be in control of the political narrative or, or the cultural themes or anything like that. Jesus wants us to lay down our lives for other people because that's what real power is in the kingdom. And I know that because that's what Jesus teaches and that's what Jesus does. I think serving is easy. Being a servant is hard. I think serving, it's, you can be self-focused. You can take care of yourself. But living a life of service it's others focused. I think serving once or twice isn't going to cost you much. Living a life of service is going to cost you a lot. So if we're going to bless people, if we're going to bless our world, if we're going to grow the kingdom of God, we've got to quit serving. We've got to become servants. And there's a host of difference in there. And I praise the Lord that Jesus Christ loves us so much, so much to forgive us when we fail at doing that and at the same time grow us to get us to that point, to make us more like him. Let's pray together. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, Lord, you know, I, 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 I stand up here and I say all this, and Lord, you know my heart. You know that I desperately want to be a servant in the same way that I, I kind of want to run a marathon. But Lord Jesus, the odds of me running a marathon are greater probably than me being a servant in my own power and in my own strength because I'm selfish. And Lord, I know that many people in this room probably can identify with that. And so God, first and foremost, I pray that if there's anybody in this room that hasn't placed their faith in you, that they would. And that they would see you, Lord Jesus, for the servant that you are and the beautiful servant you are and they would trust you today. And if you want to know how to do that, you can come and speak with me in the next steps area. But Lord Jesus, we also know that you want to grow those of us who are followers of you into being servants, living lives of, lives of servants. We may never be comfortable with that, God, but I pray you'd give us the courage to pursue that end in our lives, to make us servants just like you were a slave of all so that we might be redeemed. Thank you, Lord, for your love for us and your grace in our lives. We couldn't go another breath without it. You're a good God. We worship you. And it's in your great son's name we pray. Amen.